Hello, everyone. I thank everyone to take a part in such uh, wonderful, uh, in such wonderful event. Uh, I thank to everyone to take a part in such difficult time. Uh, we today are in an educational event to think about the future, because together, when we are thinking together, we are uh, making a lot of force. So today we have a wonderful opportunity to spend uh, time together with our guest, uh, the partner and uh, um, partner of very, very famous urbanist in the world of Jan Gale. Uh, his name is Case, hello. Hello, nice to see you all. Yes, so my name is Julian Czaplinski. I'm an architect and urban planner. Also, I was working for five years for uh, in the post of city architect in Lviv. And uh, actually now I am continue my career as an architect and urban planner. And a few words about the organizer of this event. This is the School of Construction Project Management Pro-PM. Uh, their goal, main goal is to make uh, better the construction development in Ukraine and uh, in the topics of project management and improvement of uh, its architecture. Uh, so to make all the con culture of construction in Ukraine better. So today we have timing for event um, an hour more or less. And uh, we will start with case. Uh, case, what what you pre will present today for us? I know it's about the New Zealand experience after some disasters. So maybe you will uh, dis describe for us in a few words what about we will talk about. So uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, my name is Christian Milatsen. I'm, I'm, as you heard, a partner of Geeling in, here in Copenhagen. Uh, we are an uh, internationally working urban design and urban strategy company. Uh, I'll t start by telling you a little bit about our approach, uh, and then I'll tell you uh, about how we work with cities around the world. Uh, and then, rightly so, I'll actually end by showing um, an example uh, from Christchurch, where we were involved after the earthquake. Um, and I have to say, I, I come in to speak rather humbled uh, because um, working with city planning, city development is, is about framing people's life and people's life moving ahead. And when I got the invitation, I uh, was, of course, reflecting a lot on how I could help uh, you and inspire you. And, and I can only say, I've never been in the kind of situation you are in now, but I hope that uh, our approach to working uh, quality driven, evidence driven with uh, developing cities uh, could, can inspire uh, the rebuilding of Ukraine. And I hope uh, that the film, um, which shows how we were part of the process of uh, uh, making a plan for rebuilding Christchurch after the earthquake, uh, can somehow um, uh, find a, a language that is similar to your situation. This is the closest we have been to people that has been taking away the city, their soul. And, and, and our uh, thoughts on how to also include people in, in the rebuilding. Um, the film, it's a film clip from Christchurch, and of course it's quite emotional. And I, I apologize if it comes too close, that it's just to turn off. But I hope on the other hand also it can inspire uh, how you can think beyond uh, and, and, and move forward. So that's uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, how do you think it's more uh, efficient to, to start with the video, or maybe you have some words before this. I have some slides I wanted to share beforehand uh, oh. so I'll do that now okay thank you thank you so very shortly I hope you see my screen now um, 
I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we work with cities. And as I said, I can't imagine um, uh, the situation you're in. But what we work with always is three goals. We want to develop equitable, healthy and sustainable cities for all. We worked uh, over the last 20 years in more than 300 cities in more than 50 countries. When I say that, it's not because it sounds impressive. I say it because everywhere we work, we actually study the impact on people's life with the changes that are happening in city. So we look at how life changes. We literally go out and study people's life, whether we work for big city authorities or if we work for private developers, we go out and we monitor what are the changes we're doing to the city impacting on people's life. We're not a traditional office that do building design. We work in the field of master planning and urban strategy, mobility and, and process. We are, of course, very aware of the sustainable challenges that we're facing. You probably know this very well, but 40% of the global CO2 emission comes from the built industry. This is something that, of course, is also part of the future of Ukraine, that we have to deal with sustainability. We also know that besides looking at COVID, wars, recession, climate change, we also have biodiversity. We have a mobility pattern that's changing dramatically and has huge impact on the CO2. So this is just to start to list some of all these elements that you will have to bring into the equation that for you is already complex enough as it is. The way we look at it is that it becomes really important moving forward that you think holistically. Um, I've done here a very simple diagram just showing a street section showing that how cities are organized globally. This is not different around the world. Most cities are organized in very fragmented sections. So someone cares about buildings, some ones cares about mobility, some about care about green spaces. If you don't think holistically, you end up building like they have done here in China, uh, where you have a very efficient road space. I think the traffic planner thought he had a great day. You have a lot of square meters, I think the housing department thought they had a great day. You have a lot of trees. I think the green department thought they had a nice day. I've seen the sales material from this new town in China, and it says a charming, sustainable new town. Now, I don't know about charming because cultures are different, but I know this will probably never be sustainable. So I would encourage you uh, when you start rebuilding that you think holistically and bring all the elements into the equation. Now, it's easy to point fingers at China but this is actually my hometown of Copenhagen. Despite being listed again and again as the, one of the most livable cities, this is one of our new towns. And again, we actually have made some major mistakes in creating livable spaces. Because when we build cities, this little lady in the corner of the picture is the one we built for. We evaluate as people and we evaluate the qualities. So when we plan cities, we often start like this. This is one of our master plans where we're collaborating with building architects and you see them building fancy buildings in the background, but we actually do temporary activation to find out what kind of life is it we want to have in this place. We often work with what we call the gear lens, and it's a way to digest data. As I said, we go out and observe literally on space, but we also work with online surveys, public engagement, using big data to find out what works in this given context. Of course, looking at climate, looking at cultures, but really understanding the site. When Copenhagen is uh, again and again on the top of the list of most livable cities, it's not something they became overnight. It's not the result of a building or a park or a public space. It's a result of a lot of strategies that has changed over time. As I said before, cities tend to organize themselves in silo, thinking of one aspect of the city. It's very saying for Copenhagen that already back in the early 80s, they took the traffic department and the park department and put them together and said, now we have a public space department that deals with the streets as public spaces, but also the parks as public spaces. Even today, when they put strategies forward, they use this evidence based or data driven approach we have also helped develop here in Copenhagen. So they look in their political strategy at people's satisfaction with the city, the satisfaction with urban life. 
the architecture policy that is the one that is going right now, the opening quote doesn't talk about fancy architecture, doesn't talk about the next landmark. It talks about the human experience and the city at eye level. The everyday city that really works is the city that works at eye level. And Copenhagen has changed. A hundred years ago, it looks like this. 50 years ago, we were here. This is the same space today. We have taken a strategic journey where we've slowly developed into a city for people and a livable cities for the future. It's little elements that invite people to walk, pulling the sidewalk through, giving a green light to the bicycles before the cars. But it's also documented with data. So this is a street transformation we've been evolving in Copenhagen. After the transformation, we could reduce car traffic with 60%. We could um, uh, increase bike traffic with 20% and increase pedestrian activity with 60%. We can document it when we work with an approach that's evidence-based. We have worked in a number of big cities around the world. A few years back, we were lucky enough to have Mayor Bloomberg and the Department of Transportation in New York reach out to us. They were working on a strategy, Greater Greener New York, but they needed, uh, our, to some extent, our help to also implement this on the street. And we went out and we looked at Times Square. We found out Times Square was actually 90% road and only 10% square. We said, why don't we close it? And we literally overnight changed the street into a public space. What happened was the day after you had some unhappy car owners, but you also had 400,000 happy people in, all, in enjoying life. And this temporary intervention informed the decision to then make the permanent design. What was also important about this really heart of New York was that everybody knew about this project. And what was put aside was together with the strategy was a guideline that came with some funding and every neighborhood in greater New York could apply for getting these kind of public spaces in their neighborhood. And what we saw when these public spaces were invented was that life came back to the neighborhoods. There was 50% fewer commercial vacancies. Uh, you had turnovers of shops going off. But more importantly, we also did a social impact study where we found out that when we did these kind of things, people started taking care of their neighborhood. They started feeling proud of again. We had a survey where 80% said they had picked up garbage in their local plaza that they hadn't thrown themselves simply because they wanted to be proud of their neighborhood again. I'm not saying this is relevant tomorrow in Ukraine, but it is relevant, of course, to build back the pride and the joy of your neighborhood in the city. We have worked uh, with other big cities like Shanghai. In Shanghai, we've been part of working with the Street Design Guideline, which is the first time a Chinese city has recognized the streets as public spaces. Before that, they were only corridors for cars. So a really groundbreaking document that uh, after being published in Shanghai, Beijing got one and a number of other cities around China got one. But also we work with the entire harbourfront development. So more than 100 kilometres of waterfront that has to be developed uh, along the Hongpu River in Shanghai. And we said this is incredibly complex. There was a number of uh, for different uh, municipal bodies, different kind of legislation, thousands of developers, even more architects and of course even more people that had to feel that they could develop this and deliver the quality. And sometimes when something is incredibly complex, you need a strategy that's relatively simple. So we said the overarching strategy is that this should be a continuous public space. It should connect to the neighborhoods and to public transport. It should have a diversity of program for all user groups and be inclusive. And anything that is built there should have a public purpose at the ground floor where it actually integrated with the city. The two projects have had quite an impact. This is Nanjing Lu, the extension of the pedestrian street, a car dominated space. But what we did was we went out again and just studied life. We found out here was 95% of the movement was pedestrian and only 4% was car, but 85% of the space was given to cars and merely 15% were given to the pedestrians. We said, why don't we change this? Why don't we adapt to the actual use of the space? And just last year, during the COVID lockdown, we got these photos sent over that now they have actually extended the pedestrian street all the way to Nanjing Lu. And even at the time before, there was 140,000 people here on a Saturday enjoying life, and now they can probably enjoy life. Along the waterfront, the waterfront strategy at the time, the waterfront looked very much like this. Old industry, flood barriers, unused industrial buildings. We said we made a design guideline, and of course, this is just an illustration, but we made a full design guideline of how to integrate climate adaption, 
uh, flood water, how to activate spaces, and made a guideline available for the people that were implemented. Today, these spaces look like this. I hope you recognize the buildings on the left. Um, last year, we were lucky enough together with the NGO that we are collaborating with in, in, in China to actually go back and evaluate the impact of the waterfront. And since 2016, when the strategy was implemented, they had built 45 kilometers of continuous public space in the heart of Shanghai. So a continuous waterfront death strategy is to a large extent a success. We had a game that this should support green mobility. And when we went out and did a survey, 83% arrived by foot, by bike, or by public transport. So largely people chose the greener choice to go and enjoy these new spaces. 92% of the climate adaption and flood barriers were now integrated in design as benches, as, as greenery, as elements that could bring joy to people. So the investments they had to do in climate adaption was also investment that actually benefit uh, the, the people in the city. Um, when we looked at the waterfront as such and the uses, the waterfront is still the number one tourist destination in Shanghai. But what was really important to us and to me uh, was that 80% of the users were actually close um, um, residents that were using the neighborhood as their neighborhood park. And when we looked at these new buildings that were being built, a third of the people asked said that the new public facilities, the new kind of uh, animities along the waterfront was a key reason to go there. Now, this is just an image of how you can work strategically with these kind of things. What was interesting for me along these 45 kilometers, we did a simple survey just showing how many people can we reach within a 15 minute walk. Today we talk a lot about the 15 minute city um, and we talk a lot about how much we can do within 15 minutes. And just within 15 minutes uh, walk from these new uh, public spaces, we could reach nearly 5 million people. And for me that is nice to think that 5 million people during the COVID lockdown actually had access to public spaces in the close proximity of the neighborhood. The important thing is, and, and maybe where I hope there's something to inspire to is that this was a strategy that didn't talk about a design. It talked about a direction where a number of designers could come into place and actually implement their version of the guideline and their version of the implementation so you can have a learning curve. And I think that goes from Copenhagen, it goes from New York, it goes for these new projects in Shanghai, it goes for a lot of the work that we do around the world, that it is immensely important that when we build city or rebuild city, it's important that we don't think about what can we do fast tomorrow. We think about the long-term plan. How can we bring quality over time? And how can we make sure that we can have room for evaluation, we can have room for engagement, so we can actually get people on board? Right now, we're looking at also the, looking at carbon neutral uh, in, in neighborhoods in the close proximity to the original waterfront project. And then we're looking at not tearing down and starting from scratch, but actually building on top of what's there. How can we integrate climate adaption as a quality? How can we densify within the existing structure, keeping the, uh, the, the, um, the quality of the neighborhood in place? And how can we bring new biodiversity into the site? Back to my hometown of Copenhagen, because I think there is something that's immensely important to remember when you start to rebuild. And that is, uh, we can do a lot today with CO2 per square meters. We're getting better and better, and this will be a big challenge for you also to keep in mind the sustainable footprint uh, of the future building. But there is an aspect that is not CO2 per square meter, but is CO2 per person. And it's just a little anecdote, but in Copenhagen now, 60% commute on a bicycle. So we are um, a super modern city, for, uh, for many purposes, a very rich city, but 60% commute on bicycle. When you ask people why they commute on bicycle, they don't say because it's cheap. They don't say because it's good for the environment. They don't say because it's healthy for you. Two thirds say because it's easy, fast, convenient. The infrastructure that has been embed embedded in Copenhagen over the last 30 years, prioritizing pedestrians, prioritizing bicycles, has made the easy and convenient joints to choose the bicycle, which is at the same time also the most environmental choice. So I hope when you start rebuilding that you will keep in mind that we need to make it easy to do good. 
We need to think about people. We need to think about health. We need to think about sustainability. But we have to make the sustainable choice, the healthy choice, the easy and most convenient choice. And then you can build back better and build back to an extent and be inspired by something that goes beyond. When we start with new cities, uh, we always say, consider first, what kind of life would you like to see in the future? Then consider what kind of spaces would that life need and take? And then last, consider the buildings. And this is easy to say, but it's hard to do because all around the world, there is a focus, not just in your situation, but in any situation where the focus tend to be on the building on the square meters. So easy to say, but in reality, hard to do. I hope that this idea of actually um, looking at long term strategies, looking at building quality, looking at uh, the like kind of life you want to have can inspire. I would not just change very briefly to a short film clip. And as I said, this is uh, also very emotional because this is the situation in Christchurch where an earthquake had torn down the city center and where a lot of people had a lot of emotions tied to uh, basically the physical frame of, of their life and the physical frame being uh, gone. Um, I hope it's not too soon, but I hope you can be inspired about the process there. So uh, apologies, just a second, I will just change uh, to, uh, to the video. So that was the film from Christchurch. Um, Thank you very much, Christian, for your for your video. I just wanted to round off with a few slides, if that's okay, Julian. Yes. Um, sure. I just wanted to show you this picture, uh, which is the um, elevation you saw in the film and actually the end result being built. Um, there was a lot of debate back and forth about how to build the city and there still is, but I think it was quite important for people that they felt that they were engaged in this process and that they had a plan that was long term. I, of course, don't know what the advice or the approach I have offered today can give you, but I hope that you, when rebuilding, think about the long term, think about quality, think about being evidence based um, and can be inspired by the cities that are uh, doing these kind of things. I also just wanted to say that our latest book, The Soft City, which is a, a, a book that gives some of the principles that we work by, we just donated to a Ukrainian publisher to publish in Ukraine. Um, um, so hopefully that will be out there as well as inspiration. And then I just want to end again with this. I, I hope, despite all the despair you're facing, that when you rebuild, you can approach it holistically and really build back better and build back cities where it's easy to good and have a fantastic daily life. Um, that That's all I wanted to say for now, and I'll hand it over to you, Jürgen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, when I was looking through this video, I had uh, a very strong feeling that we are like uh, stepping on the same rake, you know, uh, when uh, in, it was the case uh, with the governmental approach and the city approach. And now we have the same situation when during the war, our parliament is uh, already, it's already done. Uh, they they uh, voted for the new reform of urban policy in Ukraine, and it provides the, in a few words, the principles when the cities uh, have to organize just the official urban planning documentation, and then uh, developers can go to uh, to the construction site in very fast uh, time. So it's like they are they are argumenting that this that uh, our goal is to um, first of all rebuild the Ukraine, and it's about the five year of uh, new election term. Uh, in the second time, we have to push uh, forward the construction 
uh, developer business and uh, when we will provide a lot of new square meters so it will um, provide a, a better economics so and the, the things you showed for us is the same absolutely because uh, the um, the speakers of this uh, of this uh, reform always are insist insisting on that our um, local municipalities are failing completely in corruption for that reason we have to cut all their responsibilities and leave only uh, governmental um, influence uh, <laughs> and i'm asking forward uh, it, uh, doesn't our government's representatives corrupted as well because it's like this we are the same people in the same country so it's not about the urban planning reform it's about the um, struggling with the the corruption with another uh, approaches with judge with, with with court new courts new prosecutors a new approach it's not about the urban planning and all the approach you are talking about uh, is uh, especially from Europe uh, and where the local municipalities are, have very strong power yes and they are communicating with and they have very strong tradition to communicate with their people in Ukraine, we have another case. We have 70 years of uh, communist uh, regime where people were have, have had to prey on the very strange, strange um, powerful head, yes, of communist party or local uh, party and so on. And this um, manner is still going on. And our uh, and I'm really afraid that we will have under after the war this uh, approach when president will say I will rebuild everything I will rebuild with typical projects uh, schools 200 schools 200 kindergartens uh, 200 um, or 200 thousands I, I etc uh, of hospitals and and so on how um, what I want to, from you to hear your opinion. Uh, well, I, well, I, what, what rules? What rules have? What, what what power have to have city municipality in its hands to provide such approach as you showed us in this video? So I, I think first of all, of course, I, I don't know the political situation in Ukraine very well. I uh, as many I have learned more about Ukraine. Uh, for a sad reason the last year that I have before. Um, of course, I'm regretful of that today, but there's a limit to how much I can speak into that. What I can say is I think there is uh, an urgency. Um, oh, well, let me put it that way. When we build uh, cities, we build everybody's physical framework. We build everybody's daily life. And having studied cities globally, I know every time we change the physical form of a city, we change how people live their life. So the impact of what happens with the rebuild will have impact not just five years, but as also said in the film, for the next hundred years. It will impact if you read sustainable goals, it will impact if you read life quality, it will impact the, your opportunity to build communities. And I think the world has seen how strong you are as national community, but of course, after the war, it will be the daily community again and your daily life that matters. So it becomes incredibly important that, as I said, really to consider first what kind of life is that we want to live in the future, what kind of spaces do we need, and then last maybe the buildings. And it is, as I also said, and it's, it's also what you're reflecting on, it's easy to say, it's hard to do, but of, because often the financing is in the buildings, uh, and, and that's where the state is, uh, is also tradition. That being said, I think there is a change. And I think there's inspiration to be found. I think we see more and more that cities around the world unite. There's networks like C40 and others where great city inspires each other. And what I hope to do today was also to show that you can inspire each other. I think our project in Shanghai was also, that was actually crossing seven municipal borders. And where we said, well, actually we need an umbrella that's simple enough that everybody can tap into it and still deliver in their own right. 
Um, and maybe that's also part of it to make some guidelines uh, and, and to make a focus um, that can help steer this redevelopment. So it doesn't become on, of course you will need schools, of course you will need hospitals, of course you'll need homes, but it's also about that more holistic approach about how are they helping with communities? How are they securing long-term sustainability? How are they securing um, daily health? How are they securing, um, you know, dealing with loneliness? All these kind of everyday uh, challenges that you had before the war and that we have all around the world today. So I think that is important. And as I said, it's hard for me to tap into the local political situation, but I think it is important that there is a discussion about the values of of the rebuild um, look uh, we have also the process when our ministry uh, if, who is responsible for the preparing of building codes uh, now i'm very active in this field that to make we have to make uh, the new rules and codes and it looks like they want to you know to, to make the typology for each element of the city for roads streets for doors for everything and it's, it looks for me very strange because we have very very with different background cities so we have very european cities with very uh, renaissance city gothic cities and we have very modernistic cities and it looks very strange to make the same the same rules and building codes for each city and uh, for me it's the, the main question is that uh, the, the main re requirement from government is to prepare the official urban documentation. But it looks that you are working with the local strategies. Yes, so it's about the this uh, river coast in Shanghai. It's like it's not about the master plan or general plan for, for all entire city. It's like the program for some part and uh, what uh, what our relation what have to because we are now in the stages of reforms we can change something uh, in, in the legislation way i mean and uh, what do you think uh, how we have to organize this relations between official vertical relation documentation and horizontal relations between people and their ideas uh, like in this video but i i think there's there's things that are really interesting. We we often, when we talk with cities, we say um, a city in the past has been something that regulated or an, a state has been something that's regulated. And really what the role of a city or the role of a government today is to empower. So it's, it's more about giving that opportunity to build something that, as you say, are context related. It's really interesting this with the, the 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 building code. I mean, this is very much a, a thinking that came out of a modernist thinking in the 30s and actually implemented in the 50s and 60s, also in the Soviet Union. Um, and and for me, it's actually one of the big mysteries even today that um, the, the 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 whole structuring of cities, where we have like a traffic department, a green department, a house department, economy. That was also a very modernistic thinking. It was the thinking of the single element instead of thinking more holistically. What's ironic is today, of course, globally, we my entire career uh, has been talking about sustainability, health, all these kind of things. But still, somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of the global planning regulation dates back to the 60s and 70s, where we built some of the most dysfunctional cities. So also to readdress this with a new code might not necessarily be the right way. And maybe it's more about saying, what are the values we want to build our cities on? And then empower the local, uh, as you say, the local context to make, to um, implement those uh, values, but in the version that fits that local context, that local climate. And I realize uh, Ukraine is a very large country. Um, I know this very well from working globally in, in big countries that it's not the same to work in the north and the south of, uh, of big countries. It's not the same to work in the east and the west. Uh, and as you say, the different cities have different histories and you have to build on that. So I think this is certainly something to consider and, and bring with you in, in the time moving forward. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, I have the same uh, minds and the intentions. Uh, I always have this talking of, about the values and uh, so let's let's uh, 
talk not about the 100 rules, but one principle. So it's about the health, it's about the safety, and let architect and engineer decide how to manage these values, not to go through the a form of balcony with such size and not another. Yes, so because it's it's very stupid. Okay, the last question. We had uh, like the era of eclectic architecture during the, I, I suppose, till the Second World War. We had very different uh, styles. We had very different um, cities and 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 uh, eras. But then after Second World War, the maybe an entire world we had modernistic approach, yes? So the kingdom of concrete and steel and these horizontal uh, lines in our facades and unification uh, of some pre prefabricated elements. And uh, now we have we still in Ukraine, I don't know, maybe not in, in, uh, in Copenhagen exactly, but uh, in Ukraine and in post-Soviet countries, we still um, feel this uh, this approach. What will be the next step in the entire world? How we will, in, I don't know, in 200 years, we'll call this era. It's like sustainable architecture or new architecture era. So maybe you, you are thinking about this in your office. Yeah, I, I, I actually skipped a project, a master plan uh, that I had wanted to show, but due to time, I took it out. But what we do when we actually do master plans, and as I said, I, I, I took Christchurch in because this is the closest we have been to working in a situation like Ukraine. But what we do today is that, first of all, we rarely build, uh, our, we are, I would say, never involved in designing new cities in green fields because we need our green fields to be biodiverse. We work at infield projects, so on old industry, in gaps, riverfront, all these kind of things, simply because it's more sustainable. We can have more efficient public transport, we can have more efficient use of infrastructure, heating, all these kind of things. So there's one element that goes with that. The other element that we have is we don't design the detail of the buildings. But what we do is we run often something on our master plan that we call an integrated design process. So together with the developer, we will choose several architects and give them a building each. We'll invite the city architect in and then we'll have a dialogue process that is much more, you could say, pilot driven. So we test uh, our ambition, our values, and see how can we get the furthest. So be it wood structures, be it on shared facilities so we can have maybe a little bit less private square meters because space consumption is also CO2 consumption and more shared facilities. It also has to do with family structure changes, all these kind of things. So I think if anything, Yes, we will be talking about this era of sustainability, but I hope it's also the era of measure test refine, daring to take pilots, daring to take new initiative, and daring to actually look at each building as a unique opportunity to do better. Uh, at least that's where we are heading with our projects. So era or era of new uh, possibilities, yes, <laughs> yeah, I suppose. That's a nice thought to end that. Uh, Christian, I, I thank you very much for such fruitful time and for such excellent presentation. Uh, I really impressed. I suppose our guests, our visitors, all, 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 all also will be very um, happy to see all this information. Actually, I, I also hope to maybe to meet you in Ukraine and to work together with some uh, complicated cases. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you again for the opportunity and your time. Yeah, thank you. See you. Bye. Bye bye.